Pixel Therapy is a member of the But Why Though Podcast Network. Go to butwhythopodcast.com for an inclusive geek community offering pop culture news, reviews, and podcasts. I wouldn't call myself an anthropologist yet. I still have to graduate. I have two more years. Yeah, yeah. But it's <laughs> emerging I, anthropologist. Emerging, yes, emerging <laughs> anthropologist. Um, I'm excited to see how scholars, but how kids even back home use gaming and film and shows and art specifically to understand why, how, first of all, they're inherently anti anthropological, but how they can be used as a means to liberate entire communities from the expectations from that settlers hold, but also from our collective trauma. Welcome to Pixel Therapy, the video game podcast where we look at the games we play through the lens of the player, where what you play is just as important as how you play it, and where emotional intelligence is a critical stat. Every other week, we bring on a guest who may or may not consider themselves a gamer to discuss the games that have made them and changed them, and all the feelings they have about our favorite pastime. I'm your co-host, Jamie, pronouns she, her. And I'm your co-host, Spencer, pronouns they, them. And this is Pixel Therapy. We're kicking things off as we always do with our Patreon name in the credits tier shout outs. And the list is a bit longer this time around. So strap in. <laughs> Today, we're giving a hearty thanks to Val, Genevieve, Lindsay, Grace, Jackie, Ben, and Cortland. Huge thank you to all of you for subscribing mm-hmm. at the name in the credits tier for the month of October. If you, lovely listener, want to get your name in the credits, then just hop on over to patreon.com slash pixel therapy pod where you can unlock monthly bonus episodes for just $2 a month or chip in a little extra to show your support and get a shout out in every episode. October's Patreon bonus app was about our game of the year so far, and we do think it's worth the $2. Remember, though, if you're a fan of us here on Pixel Therapy, there are lots of ways to support the show, including sharing us with your friends and family and rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts. And if you ever have a question or just a thought you'd like to share with us, we would love to hear from you. Just send us an email to pixeltherapypod at gmail.com. Wow. Thank you. All right. It's time to get cozy. Pull up an armchair. Feel free to lie down on the couch. Let's talk about our feelings. Spencer, how you doing? Jamie, I have a lot of feelings to discuss. Oh, boy. <laughs> Lay them on me. I One am, at a time. Which like, one's first? First of all, this first is feeling. your fault. Well, I mean, in a good way, because basically, <laughs> this Excuse is... Excuse me. <laughs> in a good way, in a good way. I will not be slandered. <laughs> it's, like, it's like the opposite when of slandering. you don't say this is your fault in a good way, that's not... You don't come at someone, you're like, listen, this is your fault. This this is, wonderful thing is your fault. That's not how you this know. It's all because of you. That also sounds kind of <laughs> that sounds kind of bleak too. But yeah, thanks to you, thanks to you, thanks to you, kind of <laughs> thanks to you. Um, I am the proud owner mm-hmm. or proud friend of a dog. His name Aww. is Odin. <laughs> And he's a big sweetie. And he's a big sweetie. He's big, a big, big um, sweetie. He's big, like big, like sixty big pounds, sixty-five <laughs> pounds. He's a dog. He's a maybe I said that already. <laughs> <laughs> First and foremost, he's a dog. If there's one thing I could say about Odin, it's that he dog. He's a teed dog. Um, he's brown and darker brown, so he looks yeah. like a like a peanut butter and chocolate dog. Um, Mm -hmm. And he is the best thing that's ever happened to me. I've owned him for seven days. And the first, I gotta say, the first couple days, he was like, all that I knew about him was that they found him wandering the streets in Louisiana. Oh, poor boy. And then he'd been in the shelter system for almost a year. And that he was very shy. And they said, Mm -hmm. he is a sweet boy. He is just very shy and anxious. And Mm -hmm. I said... That is a man after my own heart. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, sounds familiar. <laughs> and that one. So he came um, all the way. He did a big road trip on the day before Halloween. And mm-hmm. I got him a hammock 
car hammock that he sat in on the way home. He absolutely did not want to come with us. He kept trying to pull <laughs> back towards the like charter van that he arrived in. <laughs> it's like, send me back to Louisiana. Yeah, he's like, it's cold as fuck. It is raining. It's dark and windy. Like, who are these people? What is happening to me? I'm going to be murdered. Um, and he definitely, like, I get the impression that he spent most of his days um, in a crate, uh, perhaps by his last owner. Um, he's been pretty much afraid of every toy that we and treat we've taken out. Um, it took him a long time to, like, he's now eating outside of his crate. And he's, like, when I come to see him and take him on walks, he starts jumping around a little bit and doing those lab tippy tappies. And uh, he's, I'm just starting to see more and more of his derpiness and friendliness. Um, but he's just the sweetest guy. And I just feel like, um, I don't know, I I had a lot of hang ups or just I told myself that I wasn't good enough to be a dog owner because it's such a big responsibility. And they are just so... Um, I don't know. It's a lot of work, you know, to train a dog and gain their trust and, mm-hmm. and be there for them and be their person. And I just didn't think I was ready for their responsibility. But then Jamie gave me this really great pep talk about how <laughs> nobody's perfect. And <laughs> I was basically like, uh, if I can do it, you can definitely do it and probably a lot better. <laughs> oh my God. No, you've been my role model for the past like five years of like, I feel like everything I do is I'm like, what would Jamie do? <laughs> WWJD, the real, right. the real WWJD. I'm getting my li- my live strong bracelets made. <laughs> Let's say WWJD. Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know where this is going to get you, but yeah, but I'm honored. Uh, it's been also awesome to be walking like five times per day because this doggy loves to be outside. I can just immediately see the way it it eases his anxiety. Mm, um, so mm-hmm. walking has been a way that we've been bonding. It's been really good for me because in the winter I tend to kind of just want to lay on the couch and <laughs> not do anything. But uh-huh. um, yeah, I just, oh my God, all you dog fans out there, I, I get it. I'm really becoming a dog <laughs> person. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this already, but we also named him Odin because uh, my partner and I uh, really had an amazing time playing Assassin's Creed Valhalla together. And also, <laughs> it was my partner's <laughs> compromise because I really wanted to do a God of War <laughs> name. And he put his foot down hard <laughs> on Atreus <laughs> and Kratos. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and he didn't seem like a Loki, but Odin yeah, uh, fit the bill. So, um, well, he seems he seems like a really really sweet boy, and it <laughs> does break my heart like how afraid you've said that he is about like toys and stuff. Yeah, know, it just seems like he hasn't had a lot of good things come mm-hmm. into his life that he's been allowed to keep <laughs> yeah. or, or like have for any long long period of time we were talking earlier this week and i was like it just sounds like he's waiting for the other shoe to drop mm-hmm. i was like and so yeah just keep reassuring him that there's no other shoe coming and Absolutely. that like this is his forever place and he he gets to keep his toys and the things that he likes oh my god watching him play with toys like we have to show him we have to sh- like we'll be like this is for you and we'll we'll try to play around with it in the ground Mm -hmm. around the floor to get him engaged and for the for days he would pick up the toy in his mouth and we would celebrate celebrate and he would just hold it like he'll just he would just be like this is what i'm going to do okay and he would pick up the toy and just hold it (laughs) wouldn't bite it wouldn't throw it around wouldn't what a chew on it would just hold it in his mouth and walk <laughs> back and forth. Uh, in this, in these past two days, he's graduated to, um, well, he'll hold it in his mouth and then we're able to tug on it a little bit. And he started tugging back and then we let him win. And we just, we would just tug it a tiny bit and yeah. then let him win. And slowly, slowly he's starting to pick up the toy and play with it himself for a few moments. Uh-huh. And it's just so heartbreaking. Cause like you said, it's like he'll start to toss it around and then he'll freeze and he'll drop it and he'll look around as if he's waiting for one of us to yell at him or mm-hmm. tell him he, to stop. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like, he's, so afraid of of just being a dog and um Mm -hmm. i don't know i i've really we've bonded really quickly uh it's become really obvious that i'm his person like (laughs) (laughs) uh he just perks up whenever i walk in and um he's always at my side even when we go outside i i 
it's I feel very spoiled by him because I haven't had to leash train him. Like he'll just stick oh, wow. to me. Uh, we got a big long like a long, long lead so mm-hmm. that like he could run around the yard, supervise, of course, um, before we don't have a fence yet. Um, but even with that long, long lead on, on him, like he'll still stick by me as I walk around the yard. And um, I don't know, it's just to bond with an animal of this size and intelligence. And every time I look into his soft brown eyes and just see <laughs> the <laughs> kindness glimmering back at me, it just like breaks my heart all over again. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I'm really happy for y'all in this journey that you're on and especially like happy for Odin because he doesn't realize how good he's got it yet. Nah. He's, he's found some great people. <laughs> um, so with all that going on, have yeah. you had any time to play some video games? <laughs> oh my gosh. So in all of the excitement of setting up my new gaming PC, my partner realized um, that he forgot to order. I guess there's a special PC you have to get that actually lets the computer access Wi-Fi. Um, so we had it all Oopsies. set up. It was beautiful. We turned it on and then we realized that we couldn't connect to internet. So um, <laughs> just a small, just small <laughs> challenge yeah. in this day and age. Uh, it really needs the internet. Right. I was like, uh, I would assume that that part would be included, but I guess there are some people who are smarter than me. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Um, that does seem like a must-have. I don't know. It's like one well, would think, Jamie. Who gets a computer and doesn't want to go online with it? I just don't. <laughs> We're bringing I back uh, CD-ROM games. Okay, okay. okay. We're like, I'm uh, going to be one of those retro hard copy collectors. I'm um, just trying to think what you could even do without having internet access because I feel like all software now gets downloaded yeah. online. It's not even like you have your like your installed disk for Windows or some shit like. Yeah, it all comes from the internet. So it's literally like you bought an expensive, pretty box. Yeah, absolutely. Because the first <laughs> thing it did was say, "Okay, time to install Windows." When I booted it up, and then it was like, "Oh, I can't. There's no internet." And, and I was like, "Wait, <laughs> what?" Anyway, so we got the part NBD. Mm-hmm. I came in like two days. It was awesome. Aaron was able to hook it up uh, really quickly, and um, so I, as soon as I had internet, I got really excited. I wanted to play a game. Jamie, you told me um, you were playing Inscription, which is a spooky game that I definitely want to play. Spooky card game. Spooky card game where you're like playing cards with a demon or something. I'm purposely not <laughs> looking up too much information about it because I yeah, do not want to be spoiled. Don't look it up. Okay, I won't. And the second game you were playing was called Unpacking, um, which I'm super... I As soon as you were describing what it was, which was unpacking <laughs> boxes, uh, uh Essentially, as you're following someone through their life, um, it I needed to play it. I really yeah. loved um, the kind of retro aesthetic of it. I mean, I want I want to let you uh, sort of give that your intro because, like, I felt like you were playing it first, and so I want to like, <laughs> give you that space. I but... don't I don't own the word on unpacking, <laughs> but you're so good at like talking about it. So, okay, anyway, um, I had to download it. So it was the, it's the first game I've been playing on my new gaming computer. I love it. I honestly have uh, playing on a computer. It instantly transported me back to being a kid, like being like oh, really? eight, wow. nine, ten, because I was playing so many games on the like. That's what I did when I was a kid. Like I would play MS Paint or or Kid Picks or this like Star Wars counting game that I had. Or where in the world is Carmen San Diego? And yes. those are all like computer games. And I feel like I'm back in the '90s, like point and click. It's like so mm. nostalgic. Um, so anyway, tell us about unpacking. <laughs> uh, so unpacking <laughs> uh, came out just uh, like a week last week, I believe. It's a small independent game developed by Witch Beam. It's out on PC, Nintendo Switch, Mac, Xbox uh, One, and Series SX. It's also on Game Pass, um, which is how I played it. Game Pass on my Xbox. Woo-hoo. Love that Game Pass. Best deal in gaming. Mm-hmm. The setup for the game is, uh, yeah, it's, I think the subtitle is, it's like unpacking a life Mm. is the full name of the game. And the game is the screen appears. There are some boxes sitting in a mostly empty room and you click on the box to open it. You click on the contents of the box and an item will come out and then you get to place that item around the room. 
It's all this really detailed pixel art, like really detailed pixel art. Mm, It's really impressive how even like very small items that are very simply drawn, it's almost always pretty obvious what it is. Mm -hmm. I I think there was like, I could count on one hand the number of times I pulled something out of the box and didn't immediately identify like what it was. Mm Mm-hmm. But yeah, so there's already in the room, there's usually already some shelving units or a closet or other spaces and you can open drawers, you can put things under the bed. It's really, really well designed. Like anywhere you think you should be able to put an item, you can mm. put it. And the way that everything is kind of assigned its own space is uh, it just feels very clean. I think I said to you that playing this game is kind of like getting like a deep tissue brain massage. Yes. It, there's just something really satisfying about taking what feels like a very um, not overwhelming amount of items. Like when I move, packing and unpacking is incredibly stressful. Mm-hmm. But there is it, in this game just this process of it's not your stuff. Like you don't ultimately have to be super attached to where it goes. You just get to do this kind of like meditative act of taking the things out of the boxes and giving everything a, a place. Absolutely. And because of the way everything kind of like clicks in to place in terms of the way they've done the pixel art and the way the spaces are designed for you to put things in them, it just feels really fucking satisfying. Mm-hmm. So even if that was like all that this game was doing, it would be for me like 10 out of 10 great like <laughs> yeah. chill out in the evening game. Yeah. But I think unpacking takes it a step further because it's also it's unpacking a life and you really do uh, interestingly enough get a narrative through the process of unpacking. So the game starts the very first room you unpack is very obviously a child's room and all you have to unpack is the bedroom. It's a handful of boxes within a child's bedroom. <laughs> You're unpacking a lot of toys. Um, you know, there's kind of like a one of those. I always wanted one of these, but never had them. Where it's like the raised bed with a desk underneath. Mm, Very like a cool. lofted bed. A lofted yeah. bed. Yeah, always wanted that. I had that. I had bunk beds. I had to share a room with my fucking brother. It's Damn. way less exciting <laughs> than a lofted bed with a desk underneath. But anyway, this kid's living the dream. Um, so you start with that room, and then you finish that level. And it slowly progresses throughout this person's life. So the next level, I believe, was uh, like a dorm. It would mm-hmm. appear to be kind of like a dorm room. And you keep going from there and working all the way through until the person has moved into a home with uh, what appears to be their partner. But it's it's interesting because like you do get a narrative through that process. Mm-hmm. Um where are you at with it? How's, how is it hitting for you? Yeah. Uh, uh, so much of what you said resonates like uh, it, the, it's deceptively rich and complex. Like it's set on this isometric grid and the pixel art, like you said, it's uh, items as small as like rolled up underwear um, or like toothbrushes and toothpaste and col- like unpacking the bathroom. I knew instantly what was the deodorant and what was the cologne and what was the shampoo. And and it's not like any of those things had brand names or were particularly recognizable. It was just that these items were so deeply familiar and uh, nostalgic. Like uh, the game is set, it, like it starts in like the mid nineties and each, uh, the, your character has this album. I guess there's someone who takes pictures of their own house and puts has an album full of pictures of places they've lived. <laughs> yeah, okay, so like the meta narrative <laughs> maybe doesn't hold up, but <laughs> um, I didn't realize like as so as you progress to each level, um, once you're finished unpacking, you pick which room is like your favorite essentially, and you say like, okay, I'm done, and the protagonist essentially takes a picture of that room and puts it in an album that they t- take with them and puts a little caption like my first apartment or whatever um <laughs> so i didn't realize that was going to happen when i clicked end level so on like the third level or, uh, or the second i'm in this shitty like dorm with like a shared bathroom and um <laughs> i clicked end level and it took a picture and so it's like this picture of beautiful cute bedroom beautiful living room bathroom full of a bunch of other people's shit like it's just like Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, like just the way items fit, um, it took all of the stress out of what is the most stressful life event for me, which is absolutely moving. Um, and also I was, I just found myself so charmed mm-hmm. by, um, just the, 
all that they were able to pack in with such a simple uh, interaction. Like, uh, like I was talking about uh, moving into a shared apartment. Um, just this feeling of, you know, you're unpacking the kitchen and you open one cabinet and it already has a bunch of other people's pans in it. Yeah. Or there's a bunch of other people's plates in, in this one. And uh, your plates are completely unmatching, but that's the only place to put them. So you're going to stack them there. And just sort of finding places for your stuff among other people's. Um, it was just such a, I was like, wow, I've never, never seen this sort of dynamic in a game before, but it is one of the most instantly familiar and resonant things to me that I, I, I've perhaps ever experienced. Like it just feels so satisfyingly real. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's such a mundane life thing, but it's so obviously game. Like, like I can instantly see how something like, unpacking a house or organizing a room would be a very satisfying game because we love cleaning up and it's such a, like it feels so yeah. good in the brain. Um, but I have never played something like this and I just, I'm, I'm just blown away by, yeah. by it. Yeah. I found myself thinking a lot too about how, I don't know. It. I, I guess I've been questioning like whether this is just like consumerism that has brought us here, but how much <laughs> like these things in our homes say about us Mm. like as people because i do think there's like like i said there's a lot of narrative that gets told through just this process of looking through a person's belongings Mm. and i don't know i think that's i don't know if that's a problem (laughs) that we're so easily defined by the things that we possess Mm. but it is an interesting concept. Um, I also thought, you know, cause well, cause like as the, as the person gets older, they have, there's a stuffed pig that makes <laughs> it all the way through. Right. But you know that they had that from childhood and that, just like that story of how that carries through. Yeah. And then how they kind of, they get more little like animal knickknacks to go around with it. And the, like there, there's these uh, like, decorative chickens <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> they chickens. start out getting and just like at each place that they move there's more and more <laughs> of the decorative chickens so you can watch them as they like a crew these decorative chickens and have fun placing them around or you see the point where they get very into having plants mm-hmm. um and suddenly there's plants all over the place um i think it was the chapter that you referenced where you it seems like you're moving in with a douchey boyfriend. <laughs> oh yeah, that's, that's and, the and one just like, Yeah, yeah. There's no room for mm-hmm. any of your stuff mm-hmm. anywhere, and it's just so it was such an easy way to say like you don't fit in this person's life. No, I absolutely, and just in in that same guy's apartment, like um, it's like clearly it was a planned move because your boxes are in all of his apartment rooms and like you go to the bedroom and you open the drawers to put your clothes away and all of his underwear and socks are just kind of strewn haphazardly in the drawers and so not only do you have to find space for your own stuff but you have to kind of clean up his drawers and organize them to make room for yourself and it's just a minute like that I immediately was like, oh my God, every boyfriend I've ever had who I've basically had to be his mother and like teach him how to (laughs) take care of his space and kind of like do the unseen like femme labor that's placed on people who have been socialized, you know, as a certain gender. Like I just feel like um, that instantly resonated and all they had to do was, all they had to do was, you know, have you open that drawer and see that mess. And I feel like for anyone who's, who's had to be that person or serve that function, you instantly knew who this who this man was um yeah. and things like that really do say a lot about someone like how do they leave their space how do they accommodate someone else how are they thinking about your needs like i think moving in together um like it, it's clear that he wasn't thinking about your character's arrival and how how that space was meant to be shared. And, and that does say a lot about him as a person, um, not even about like the things he has, but like how he arranges the space um, too. like just another yeah. layer of what you're talking about, about what things say about us. It's like mm-hmm. how we treat our things also says something about us. Yeah. Um, and I love the way the game, um, like the the puzzle is like a puzzle element to the game. And I think it comes mm-hmm. in in terms of, um, you know, like you might be in the kitchen and just like, this is definitely how I pack, but like you're unpacking a box of kitchen stuff and then maybe a sock comes out and you're like, oh shoot, I need to make sure I go over to the bedroom and put this somewhere. Um, but when it comes to things that need to be in the bedroom, you could... Um, 
you know, throw everything on the bed and call it done. Like you could do that. And something I did that I found like, just like real life, like something that I do is I'll, whenever I'm moving into a new space, I'll put all the clothes on the bed um, and then I'll organize them. And so in this game, I found myself doing that too. In the bedrooms, I would put all, I would fold all the shirts and put them on the bed and all the pants. And then I determine what I can hang and what I should fold and put in what drawer. Um, It was just like, it was so real. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I love this game. (laughs) <laughs> and you kind of have to do that because or, or, or like you, there definitely has to be some th- forethought because I definitely a handful of different times like found myself running out of hangers. Like mm-hmm. there is something about not knowing what's coming out of the boxes that makes that planning element a little more important because there were definitely several times I was like, oh, my God, if I find one more DVD, I just don't know where I'm going to put yeah. it. I filled I filled the shelf that I assigned the DVDs. And yeah. then it's like, oh, there it is. One more DVD. OK, I'm going to clear this whole shelf out and I'm going to go clear this other shelf. I'm going to move this stuff over here. And now the DVDs are going to go over here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And, and speaking, I remembered now about what I was thinking about with the puzzle element stuff, too, which was just that um, the way that items can be like we hold on to things because of the points in our life that we remember that they remind us of, or, um, you know, the pieces of ourself that we want to carry with us, even as we change and grow. Um, and even, and then the things that we don't, like maybe we hold on to them because it's a memory, but it's not even something that particularly like brings us joy as Marie Kondo would say. Um, but there's like a moment where, um, you know, as Jamie mentioned, you, you date this kind of douchey guy, it's implied. And then, um, you know, Spoiler, um, the next chapter has you moving back to your childhood home, um, unpacking your things in a room that is the same room that you played in the first level, but suddenly feels much smaller where, with all of the things that you have with you. Um, and I found myself playing that level and not being able to finish. Um, like there's, if, if an item is not in, a, in an appropriate place, like the appropriate room, um, it'll kind of flash red and not let you complete the level. And for the longest time, I was like, everything's where it should be. Like, what's wrong? What's wrong? And I realized that I had put some photos onto a bulletin board above my bed and it was photos of me and my friends. Um, and one of the photos, uh, the, the, when you hang it up, the protagonist puts the thumbtack through the face of one of the people. And I realized that that was supposed to be a picture of myself and my ex. And in Mm -hmm. order for the level to be completed, what I needed to do was put the picture somewhere that the protagonist wouldn't have to see it. And so (laughs) (laughs) I put the photo like into the cabinet and closed it. And then the level was like, you did it complete. (laughs) Uh, it was was such a it was just a small twist uh one that you know really reminds you that you're you know you're seeing into this person's world where Mm -hmm. like you're doing something that makes so much sense for what you would do in real life too like you might not want to throw away the picture but you definitely don't want to see it every time you get out of bed um Mm -hmm. and just the fact that as the you know as the player i needed to hide it from my (laughs) invisible protagonist it was just such a charming and relatable and sweet moment and i just love the way that they thought about puzzle puzzle making and solving in this game and i love the one thing that you take from that shitty boyfriend is the uh his apparent uh coffee snobbery (laughs) because if you notice after that point like before that point you don't even have a coffee pot (laughs) and after it you have like the coffee grinder and (laughs) like a french press (laughs) and coffee beans that you move into the rest of your homes Mm -hmm. after that point i thought that was really funny that that was kind of your one Absolutely. Thing that you kind of hung on to from that relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, if you need some, as we transition into this long, dark winter, if you need a little little brain booster, a little free serotonin, definitely pick up uh, <laughs> unpacking. But, Jamie, uh, what else have you been playing? Uh, so I also uh, chewed my way. Uh, I devoured. <laughs> yeah, I devoured Guardians of the Galaxy, which also oh, came yeah. out like a couple weeks ago in October. Um, this is uh, developed by Eidos Montreal, published by Square Enix. It's out on basically everything: mm-hmm. PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo, Microsoft, Windows, all that. Um, it's a Big AAA game, um, which I'd kind of been wanting, as we talked about in our last episode. I'd been wanting something meatier to get into, and this definitely fit the bill for me. It actually, it it really landed, and I kind of couldn't put it down. I played mm. through it pretty quickly. <laughs> I already got the platinum and everything. My God. 
I know. Well, I ended up taking a long weekend from work because work's just been hellacious. Love and that. I wanted some extra time. And then I used that time to Fuck yeah. beat Guardians of the Galaxy. How long is it? Um, total with platinum, it was it took me about twenty five hours. Damn. So girl. Yeah. <laughs> I think if you weren't going for the platinum, you could probably do it in twenty or less. Okay. Um so this is a uh third person action adventure narrative based game. You're playing as the titular Guardians of the Galaxy. You actually play the game as Peter Quill. Mm-hmm. Um this is Marvel for folks uh who aren't familiar with the comics or the Marvel Cinematic Universe. These are the comic book heroes. Um, I would say the the characters themselves, they're not uh, directly pulled from the MCU, but they're also not directly pulled from the comics. It's mm. it's uh, Eidos Montreal's kind of like their version of the Guardians of the Galaxy. They're definitely drawing a lot on the movies. Mm. So if you like the cinematic Guardians of the Galaxy films, I think there's a lot in here. That speaks to that. They're uh, pulling a lot of the similar kind of music vibes. They're definitely Mm. hitting on the comedy notes that I think the films try to hit on. Um, And the characters are kind of uh, twists, like Mm. light twists on what we see in the movies. Uh, But there's definitely a lot of uh, connective tissue. Refreshing. yeah, it, it actually, I found it a very, like, refreshing take on the characters. As someone who <laughs> generally likes the Guardians of the Galaxy films, um, but finds them to... I guess I didn't know what my critiques of the Guardians of the Galaxy films were until I played this game, because hmm. I think I actually like the characters in the game better. Ooh. As better versions of the Guardians of the Galaxy, especially Peter Quill. <laughs> hmm. Maybe that's just because I played as him. But the game takes a slightly more mature version of Peter or one mm-hmm. who's really trying to be a good leader to his team. And because you sit in his shoes, you're so the game gives you a lot of narrative decisions to make. There's a lot of dialogue choices to make. There's dialogue trees in the game. I would say this game's pulling from a lot of different it, it's. It's perhaps a jack of all trades, master of none, because it's it's pulling things from Mass Effect. Um, it's pulling things from Uncharted mm. uh, style wow. games. It's trying to do a lot of different stuff. I don't know if it does any of it perfectly, but mm-hmm. it does it all good enough to be a pretty fun time. This isn't going to be my game of the year, but it was a really enjoyable experience. And I really like the narrative and I really like the characterization of the Guardians. So. Yeah, like I said, you're playing a slightly more mature version of Peter Quill. Um, but in his shoes, you're you're working with the Guardians at a time where the team has kind of only recently come together as a full crew. Mm. There's a lot of distrust on the team. Um, the way this narrative sets up is that uh, Quill and Rocket Raccoon and Groot have... A tree. More, the tree, yes. <laughs> Tall tree boy. A tree person. They all have a bit more history with each other. Mm. And uh, Drax and Gamora are somewhat newer mm. to the team. And Drax and Gamora do not trust each other. Drax is still very much uh, calling Gamora an assassin and mm. a betrayer because she's the daughter of Thanos. In this version of the Guardians, uh, Drax uh, killed Thanos. So oh, Thanos is already like not a threat anymore, although it is alluded and this is not really spoilers, but it's kind of alluded in the game that um, perhaps Thanos might still be out there. Ah. Um, but the, the large war against Thanos is already a thing of the past. That's like behind us for the mm. setting of this game. Um, and the Guardians, uh, and you know, Thanos is the big bad. And yeah, the, sort of- Thanos is the big bad. If you're not an MCU head, maybe yeah. just fast forward to the yeah. interview because this <laughs> probably isn't for you. But if you ever kind of wanted to get into comic book stuff, I do think this is a great introduction to the characters. OK, cool. And and getting to interact with them more deeply. There's just a, an amount of time and space. Aha, uh-huh, puns, because <laughs> the Guardians exist in outer space. Uh, that this game is given, that the movies are not given. Um, You just get to spend a lot more time with the characters and have really deep conversations with them. It does this thing where you go into a chapter, you're on a mission, you're doing a thing, you'll be fighting through a battle. Combat is, uh, I actually found it really fun and interesting because you're the captain of the team. So 
you can both fight as Quill. Quill has guns and he has jet boots, uh, so he's he can move around the battlefield very mm. quickly. But he's certainly not the most powerful of the member of the team with just his guns. So you actually can uh, give commands to the other guardians mm. in battle. And they each kind of have different focus areas that they're good at. So Groot, um, being a tree, he can do a <laughs> lot of moves that um, basically grab enemies and pin them mm. uh, in, in, sp- in a spot. Rocket does a lot of... Uh, AOE area of effect damage with bombs. Mm. So it's a lot of bomb based damage that can hit a lot of enemies at one time. Gamora is, she's an assassin. She's got swords. She's the person you're sending in for a big high damage hit on one enemy. And Drax is good for stagger damage. So Mm. he kind of just bulls through people and, and knocks them out. Nice. So you want to kind of use, you know, depending on who you're facing, you might be fighting one big boss at a time. You might be fighting a lot of smaller enemies at a time, but you kind of piece all of those moves together uh, based on the situation that you're in and giving the gar- different guardians uh, commands to uh, corral the battlefield and take everyone out in a reasonable time frame. <laughs> Um, you also get these moments in battle where you can call a huddle <laughs> and it's kind of like the actual animation for the huddle is very corny because it like, it like goes into first person mode and Quill's like down on one knee and he's like, all right guys, come in and they, uh-huh. and they all come in and they're all like standing over you and they'll say like some corny ass shit. It, it's very corny, but it's like still what? kind of corny like, like hype as hell. They're like, we're crushing them, but you have to like <laughs> listen to what they're saying and like keywords of what they're saying will like flow in the background above their heads uh. and then you have to respond in a way that like pays attention to what they said so like if they're talking about how much mm. ass they're kicking you've got to be like hey I know this is a lot of fun and we're really kicking ass but stay focused so that oh, we can like or, or we're going to lose it and then if you say the right thing if you pick the right response to them They'll be like, yeah, and like they'll all like, be, and they'll run back out to battle, <laughs> and everyone will be like supercharged, and they can all do their super moves. And some ridiculous like Guardians of the Galaxy esque song from like wow. the seventies or eighties will Sounds kick like on Persona and start 5. playing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it, it definitely has some of that like uh, hype, mm. the, some of the Persona Five hype to it. So all of those moments are, even when it was corny, it was like. It was fun Mm. and engaging. Um, But then when you, after you finish a mission, you come back to your ship, you get opportunities as Peter to walk around the ship and have conversations. There's, you know, dialogue options with the characters where you can kind of learn more about their backstory, more about what's going on with them. You can find items when you're out in the world that you'll bring back and give to the different guardians as gifts. And then if you go to their room and interact with the item, they'll have a larger conversation piece with you about the item. So you get to know more about them and where they came from and what they care about. A lot of those moments really hit like there, there was a lot Mm. of interesting stuff. I mean, this is, if you don't know much about the guardians of the galaxy, like they're a team of misfits essentially that have come together um, because they all, not, they all struggle to have real relationships with other people. Mm -hmm. And so they, and they're all kind of, shady characters in a sense they've all done bad shit um they're all anti-heroes really you know they're they're not necessarily good um true straight a heroes they're people who have questionable morals but who ultimately have hearts of gold Mm. and want to do the right thing and they come together because they all can kind of bond over the fact that they've all had different Uh, traumas in their life different hard shit that they've gone through they've all lost people close to them and because they're all kind of like bad at trusting people and bad at leaning into relationships they find a way to come together as a team and build that that trust with each other so they're kind of they have this like kind of dysfunctional family thing going on Mm -hmm. so getting more time to spend with each of those characters and learning more about their own motivations and their own backstory was was really cool and the overall narrative of the story which kind of hinges on this uh it's not really spoilery because i'd say this happens within the first quarter of the game but basically this question is posed of like peter might be a father oh and the way that plays out through the story um and how that's used as motivation for the narrative arc that they're all on and the conversations that he gets to have with uh, especially drax like the characterization of Drax in this game is really fucking good. 
Um, again, for folks who don't know, Drax is uh, Drax the Destroyer is what he's known as. He's this big, tough, uh, green tattooed guy. And like we said, killed Thanos uh, within the context of this game. But he killed Thanos because Thanos killed his family, his his wife and daughter. And uh, Drax comes from a people who are very literal. They speak very literally. Um, and they're also like, they're hunters and fighters. Um, so he's not an especially emotional guy, but with the context of Peter struggling with this possibility that he's a father and the conversations that him and Drax have out of that mm. were really meaningful. I don't know. That's I thought awesome. it was a, I thought it was a really good game. I thought it was a fun time. It was fun to play. It's beautiful. Like the actual design of the game is really cool. You also can unlock lots of fun outfits for the characters as you play. So like all the collectibles <laughs> felt really rewarding. If you're if you're looking for a triple A game of this nature, I think this is well worth your time uh, mm. and money. I love the way that that allows you more time to just spend getting to know these characters in a way that. Like even though it's in, it's loosely inspired by the film, um, it's like in the film you're never gonna be able to see the deep. Like you'll hear their pasts referenced or their characters. You'll sort of get to know in the context of you know the few minutes you have in a two hour movie to really devote to diving deep on each person. But I just I love hearing the way that um, this game is able to you know it sounds like give you a whole new perspective and understanding of of these folks. Well, yeah, I mean when you think about it, like the movies collectively are less than five hours, right? You know, and I guess like you could add up all the screen time that you get with the guardians in some of the other movies in the MCU, but it still all comes out to, you know, maybe six hours max, right. That you actually see them on the screen and get to spend time with them. Like I said, at the beginning, I spent 25 hours in this game. So you're just, you're immediately afforded so much more time uh, to spend with them. But they, uh, one other thing I forgot to mention is that, because you're constantly running around with the entire team with you, there's so much dialogue that doesn't need to happen in a cutscene that just happens mm. organically. And this is kind of something that I think the game takes from games like Uncharted and The Last of Us, where you're running around with companions and they're talking all the time. In fact, this game is talking constantly. The <laughs> characters are constantly in dialogue. And that could have been annoying, but the writing is so good. Mm. I, I mean, I've laughed multiple times throughout playing this game because mm. you know the guardians of the galaxy movies these characters they are very funny and the way they interact with each other is very funny and i i just i thought the writing was super on point i was i was laughing i was uh invested in the different dramas between the characters mm. and the characters even comment when you do video game shit <laughs> like when you're like i'm gonna go down this path that i know is not the right path yeah. because there might be a collectible down here like they comment on it and it's an interesting <laughs> comment every time they're like having an interesting in conversation or making fun of you as Peter, their leader, because you're running off to like stick your nose in something yeah. that you don't need to be invested in. So I don't know. It's just like the way the game responds to you, the way the character, they, they all feel alive. Like you feel like you're interacting with the guardians. Awesome. Yeah. Good time. We're going to go ahead and transition over to our interview. Now today we are chatting with Charity Ropati, an undergraduate student activist attending Columbia University and a 2019 Center for Native American Youth Champion for Change. Charity works to decolonize public education and addresses the dropout and graduation crisis of Indigenous students through Native-centric curricula. We dove deep with Charity to discussing what it means to reclaim and hold narratives of past trauma and how games and game narratives can be a tool in this process, both as a way to break cycles and heal from trauma. We also spoke at length about defying settler expectations, creating anti-anthropological media, and viewing climate change through an understanding of the dual impact of colonialism and capitalism together. So, you know, just some light, casual stuff. Uh, It was a deeply honest conversation, and Spencer and I both really resonated with Charity's perspective on games and storytelling. We hope you all will, too. So without further ado, here's our interview with Charity Rapati. Hello to our wonderful guests, and thank you so much for joining us in the Virtual Pixel Therapy Studio. To start, can you share your name and your pronouns? Yes. Um, so I'm going to introduce myself in my native language, my native language, if that's all right. Sorry, I'm like stuttering. Um, Hello, everyone. My name is Charity Rapati. I am Yupik and Samoan, and my native name is Agubach. This was a name given to me by my grandmother um, back home in Alaska. So my family is originally from Kongsvinger, Alaska, but I grew up in Anchorage, um, 
one of the biggest cities there so we have access to everything mm. um yeah i'm 20 years old i'm an undergraduate student at columbia studying civil engineering and anthropology and a lot of the work i do um is in um, education, but I'm really passionate about permafrost degradation and how climate change has affected and is affecting our communities. Mm. Um, really excited to be here. I, when I got your email, I was super excited. <laughs> um, it's just really cool how gaming can use can literally be used as a means to like navigate identity and personhood. Can mm -hmm. use as a means of liberation too, especially for a lot of mm -hmm. kids in our generation. So thank you for just creating a space for um, organizers just to talk about really fun things in their communities and how gaming can be um, used that way. Thank you. Again. Super excited. I also use she, they pronouns. Very excited to be here. Awesome. Thank <laughs> you for being here. We are so, so happy to be talking with yeah. you. Um, Charity, you mentioned a little bit about what you're up to, but can you tell us a little bit about how you like to spend your time? Yeah, I love that question. I actually am not asked that a lot. Um, yeah, so I watch, I love um, films and um, just mm. like watching shows. So like one of me and my siblings' favorite shows um, is Avatar The Last Airbender. And oh my God, Aura. yes. Yes, so um, my younger sister is also, we're both like queer. Like we're the only two, two queer people like in our immediate family. And luckily mm. my family's very supportive. So she has mm. a girlfriend. But um, uh, Legend of Korra especially was one of our favorite shows because you just never saw, you know, a femme, you know, or a lesbian, not a lesbian, but this like a femme. Like, like Korra and Asami, I love them. So like, mm -hmm. we grew up seeing that type of representation. When we were kids. Like but, femme for femme representation, yeah, because, not having it be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah you exactly. Go. <laughs> I'm glad you understand. That. So it was just like very, you know, we could see ourselves in that way. And also like even the water tribe within the Avatar mm. world it's based on our people. So it was really cool mm. to like reimagine our lives outside of the trauma um, that was passed down to us because of colonialism. So mm -hmm. the idea of like being, my brother wants to be like a fire. He's like a 12 year old kid. He wants to be a firebender. He still does. He just <laughs> So it just allowed us, it gave us space to like reimagine our lives outside of what we were told to be. And our parents always mm -hmm. didn't to do anything. So like mm -hmm. one of the reasons why like I'm here is because of that, but. Yeah, Absolutely. films like Boy, the movie Boy by Taika Waititi. He's like my favorite mm. director. Uh, Marada Mita, she's this amazing New Zealand director. One of the first Native women who film, who like produced and directed a film. Um, mm. Came out with really amazing films centered around identity. And I'm just tired of watching movies that just center our trauma. But mm -hmm. we, me and my siblings or like even some of my friends here, we try to find films um that center our imagination and it doesn't even have to be about like indigenous like i love supporting like just i non-white i'm so tired i'm yeah. i want in so, seeing films like that has been really that's what i do in my free time i watch movies yeah sorry i'm like right. ranting but i love i love that question i mean it's a podcast so this is the place to rant <laughs> it's very <Thank> welcome <laughs> um no i i love hearing that and it's it's so true that like um you know experiences um i'm i'm filipino american so yes. you know it's often like i spent time before um, i'm a design i work as a designer these days but i used to oh. do arts and theater coverage um mm -hmm. uh, of local productions in the area and and one of the reasons that i think i eventually stopped writing or not completely but i think i stepped back from it it was because um i remembered that i was assigned to cover um a series of plays by A. Ray Pamatmat, who is a queer Filipinx yes. uh, playwright. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, I wrote my reviews. I was, I was stunned by his playwriting because, uh, these is the Inde pronouns, but one of the things that they're known for is writing plays that are absolutely populated with Filipino characters. Right. Um, but they're Filipino American, which means, which this is obvious, but it's like they're living their lives and they happen to be Filipino. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not like other depictions of, you know, many depictions of, of Asian folks on stage. It's like right. you're the housekeeper, you're the servant, especially South, Southeast Asian, like you're a nurse, you're, you're never the romantic hero. You're never allowed to be multidimensional or right. to have stories that have nothing to do with your, um, you know, racial, ethnic background. Um, and every other review that came out about the play, um, the reviews were actually mixed and they were all from white male um, critics mm. saying things like, why wasn't their culture more on display? 
Why was the main character a girl trying to act like a boy? Why weren't they talking more about the racial issues that Filipinos face in the U.S.? Right. Maybe because when we're at home, that's not <laughs> our relation to whiteness is not the center of our conversation. Right. No, this is so because like I I don't know if we can talk I um but like it's we talk about this all the time but so many settlers hold expectations for mm. communities of color when it comes to our people on screen, mm. and so when film producers, indigenous film producers, because there are indigenous peoples even in um, the Philippines. I will, First of all, I love Philippines mm-hmm. so good. But um, <laughs> when people, when films are produced by indigenous filmmakers from that area, um, there's so much criticism where they're saying, well, this is anti-anthropological. You're supposed to educate me. Mm. You're supposed to, I thought you guys were supposed to like, I thought you're fighting like, I thought you guys were going extinct and you're finding that expectation that of the disappearing, like for us, the disappearing Indian. And, you know, Taika Murata Mita produced films um, that are coming of age films. A lot of Polynesian kids can relate to. They're like, and they, they have an anti-anthropological edge. Like why are we expected to educate people um, about our existence when we could create films that focus on our healing? Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's what we're going to go into today too, like gaming, especially in our generation. Mm-hmm. I hate being called Gen Z, but I am fortunate. I'm fortunately, I feel very mixed about it, but I am part of this generation where gaming has been used as a means to like navigate that, especially mm-hmm. back home in Alaska Native communities. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I relate to what you just said. I think it's, I couldn't have said it any better. Um, so thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, with that in mind, you've sort of spoken to it a little bit, but do you identify as a gamer, Charity? You know what? I honestly don't. I um, played a lot of games when I was younger um, with my yeah. siblings, my younger sisters. We had the Wii. So, like, this was at the time when the Wii became a thing. And so my family, we we were, like, low income. But my mom and dad always found a way to get us a new gaming console, console whenever it came out. And so I'm really thankful for them for that. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were able to, like, relate to a lot of our classmates when they are like, oh, do you get, like, the new Wii U? Or, like, did you get the new Wii um we're able to get like the new mario kart like extension like steering wheel yeah well, yeah we could, <laughs> our parents got it for us so i uh, gamer when i was younger gamer now i'm not i tried help i tried playing my brother um call of duty i don't even know the names of the games right now call of duty um Attack on it's okay. Titan. We don't know. I, we don't know the call of duty is out. Yeah. And so I can't like i Brother tried teaching me. He was like yelling at me at the whole time. It was really fun when I was back home. So I was like, in the past, but like not now. But my siblings are definitely, they're all gamers. Mm. And you mentioned, you know, having a lot of great memories with the Wii when you were younger. What was the significance of gaming to you at that time? What memories do you associate with it? Yeah. So we grew up, um, there's a lot of, Anchorage has one of the largest urban native communities other than LA and California. And so um, when you're a native living living in an urban space, especially coming from a low income background, um, it's hard because not only are you disconnected from the original homeland your people are from, but mm. you're living in an area where casual racism against natives is really bad. And so, um, I'm also like multi ethnic, so I have a like a visibly Samoan dad and like a visibly um, Yupik mother. Mm. I love my parents; they do like. Me and my sister have like full rides to colleges right now, and it's it's because mm. of our parents. So, but growing up in that type of space was violent at times. Like, obviously not in our own household. Like, it was very loving. Mm. Um, I shared a room with my uh, two other sisters, and so we had like a bunk bed and then like a single. And so me and my older sister were on the bunk bed. But um, <laughs> you know, especially like with gaming, it was just a means to relate with one another. And so if we were back home in the village. There's traditional games or there's basketball or our grandmother's there yeah. right now. She's thank God she's alive, like after all of the COVID stuff. But mm-hmm. um, a, a lot of native kids like back home in the village, like there are games there. There are there's a community um, for you to stay in good relation with one another. And so when you live in an urban city um, and there are other native folks um, but particularly with us, we're mixed native. So like we're, mm. you know, half Samoan and Yupik. And so mm. when navigating spaces, um, it was just weird um, walking around stores. People in Anchorage are just, people in Alaska, especially like settlers are very, they treat native people with so much disrespect despite 
you know, because we that was that's our land, you know, that's, yeah. that's where we grew up. Um, mm-hmm. So gaming was used as a means to um, stay in good relation with one another. It was a way to stay in good relation with our cousins who came in Anchorage whenever um, they came, because you know people come to get food because food is expensive, like back home. Mm. So um, gaming especially was used to like just step back from that because sometimes it can be too much but it was used to just heal and like have fun like we play super mario bros on the wii yeah we'd all have like characters we'd always go to we had our ds's you know everyone if you know oh, yeah. DS, yeah we brought that shit we, I mean, we brought that shit to school too so it was just like used as a means to like just step back and like not be reminded you know because i don't know i feel like especially when it comes to indigeneity like it could be a lot sometimes, especially mm-hmm. with the expectations that people hold for you and your people, but also how class-based engage with you. So like gaming for us at home was used as a means to step, almost step out of that world and like have fun, mm-hmm. um, feel, navigate our own identity, but also stay in good relation with one another. Um, mm. So yeah, it was good. I loved it. I miss those yeah. days. I'm like 20 now, like studying mm. engineering here and I'm like, Oh, I'm so tired, but yeah, it's worth it. I'll be okay. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something my younger sister and brother still do when they're at home. They play the Wii game. Like our dad got us the PS4, so I don't even know how to work that. My brother's really good at playing that. Right? He's like yeah. playing on there, so <laughs> we still use gaming as a means to like navigate identity, but also just stay in good relation with one another back home. Absolutely. So on this show, we we love to sort of invite folks in to talk about games um, that have impacted them. And another game you mentioned to us was Never Alone. Um, I wanted to take a minute to talk about that game as well, just because um, just for folks, the folks at home listening, um, Never Alone is a game that actually came about when members of the Cook Inlet Tribal Council, which is a nonprofit organization in Anchorage that provides educational and social services to Native Alaskan folks, um, actually broached this idea um, that a video game could be a new way of providing opportunities for folks in the community while also preserving and sharing um, pieces of their oral tradition. Um, as a result, the Tribal Council created uh, Upper One Game in 2012, a a game studio um, that partnered and eventually merged uh, with a more experienced New York-based developer called E-Line Media. And they actually came together to pioneer this new genre for gaming that they're calling World Games, um, with the goal of celebrating and extending uh, world cultures through digital games. Um, There were actually 40... um, Inupak uh, elders and storytellers um, who were involved in the creation of this game. Um, And it's a puzzle video game. It was released in 2015, um, featuring an Inupak girl named Nuna and her Arctic fox as they navigate this, uh, or sorry, navigate and investigate an endless blizzard that's threatening um, their way of life and their community. Um, The game is built around stories from Native Alaskan culture um, told in eight chapters. And as you progress, you actually unlock videos, um, little uh, interviews uh, with folks, with the elders and storytellers that I mentioned earlier, um, sharing stories from their own lives, from their childhood, um, just insights or um, philosophies uh, around their culture. Um, And there's over 30 minutes of this preserved uh, video footage that you can unlock throughout the game. Um, So, Charity, you shared with us how when Never Alone first came out, um, you were just struck by the realization that storytelling could be shown in this way through games. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. Like, what makes video games an especially exciting platform for storytelling? Yeah, I remember particularly when this game was premiered. So, Anchorage, um, there's this conference called the Elders and Youth Conference that's held every year. And um, the native, urban native community there, I'm just really proud to be from that community because I feel like they do a really, or just we do, we do a really great job with engaging with um, our elders and youths particularly. And so mm. um, when that game first premiered, they had the, the the game makers like come and speak to like little native kids there. And it was just like this big oh. conference room. And so it's amazing. You, you know, it was, it was it was amazing because like there were so many kids who were like, well, I want to do that now. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause I feel like a lot of us, especially back home in Alaska are pushed to do engineering or STEM. I mm-hmm. want to do it because I like it, but I, I, I'm, there's a lot of native kids who have that same sentiment where 
um, we're pushed to do one thing or education is the tool or we have to escape from this life. No. And so mm. they really showed us that like we could use game making to navigate identity and um, storytell. And so I feel like even now, um, Taika even talks about it. I talk about him way too much, but I think he's wonderful. <laughs> but um, this idea of like, we are the original storytellers. This is something mm. especially little native kids need to understand. And this can be navigated through any type of platform. And so when I was like a little kid and I saw that look back, in 2012, I think, um, come out. Um, oh my God. I was just like amazed. Mm. Um, I was like, my eyes were wide open. Like I was there with um, my family, but um, me and my siblings were just like stunned because, you know, we never could imagine um, that, you know, parts of your identity, the stories that your grandmother told you growing up as a little kid, um, mm. you'd be displayed on a platform like that. And so, um, it's like a moment that we even had with Avatar, like seeing our own culture mm. displayed, like on an, just in animation. Um, yeah. There was an, an, another avenue that little Native kids could go to um, to navigate identity and to understand not only trauma, but the resiliency of their people. And I think that's really beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. So that game's phenomenal. Um, I unfortunately never got the experience to play it. Um, but that was when, because they were still, when they were presenting that, they're like, well, we're going to come up with this game. And I was like, ooh, and they're like, it's not out yet. And I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> I was like, if it was, I would have gotten it. Um, but I was just amazed and stunned because, like, it's 2021 now, but there are yeah. so many better representations of, like, shows and movies. But also there are other, the way, there's so many, so many Native kids across the world um, who are using poetry, who are using dance, who are using art, designs, mm. um, STEM. Um, like just words um, to describe identity and personhood and um, that video game particularly um, just showed me especially that you know gaming can be another avenue that native kids can turn to um, to, to fully understand this because I feel like everyone can probably relate to that one like coming of age understanding like who am I who am I like who am I defined by am I defined by um colonial trauma and uh, am I defined by the expectations that people hold for me the expectations that settlers hold for me mm -hmm. um, so it's just understanding those questions and gaming and particularly um even the name is powerful never alone oh my god like I'm not trying to tear up already but like that's right it's just really powerful because um there are so many even like native scholars who talk about how our people were never meant to survive and so um even the, the term never alone is so beautiful because I remember they're showing us like a little snippet of the game. And the fact mm. that I, I was like a little kid, I still remember that snippet, but um, the idea that like in the game, one of the modes was like, you, uh, you needed to help one elder, your ancestors would talk to you. And Oh my God, I'm not trying to cry, but that's just like such a beautiful thing because like, like even for kids, like who go to, who pursue school or who like outside of like their village, like sometimes you need to turn back to what your elders said, mm. or turn back to what your grandmother told you. And, um, that could really root you or like bring you back, you know? So, um, it's just a really inspiring, um, and beautiful game. And it's something, you know, I hope they know the Cook Inlet Tribal Council is an amazing, good, amazing job with that, but I hope they know, um, the impact that they had, particularly mm -hmm. um, just native kids in our generation. Um, absolutely. Yeah. And having the, like going for something like a game, which, takes so much effort and so long to build. You don't really know how it's right. how that's going to be received or if it's going to be successful until after it's released. Um, but at the same time, just seeing the potential in a game to be something that can hold all of these things to make space um, for interacting with identity and also preserving and making sure you know, history, oral history is captured and right. it cannot be erased. It cannot be overwritten and it can't be deleted. Like right. it's there. It's, it's preserved forever. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, I mean, it's a beautiful thing. It's incredible. Um, there, uh, I'm, I'm starting to get <laughs> emotional. Um, there's a, <clears throat> I just what what you were speaking to reminded me of this quote I had pulled from a um, self-identified American Indian game critic uh, named Dan Starkey, and he wrote a review of Never Alone uh, for Eurogamer uh, back in 2015 when it came out, and he wrote. Um, 
I've internalized complacency, this casual belief that there's no point in trying to keep traditions alive because in a few generations, they'll be lost no matter what I do. It's a mentality I've seen echoed a few times in games. The Ashlanders of Morrowind, the Krogan of Mass Effect, never alone is different. Its very existence challenges me. Instead of eliciting self-pity, it stands in absolute defiance of everything that I've grown to be, not only telling me to be better, but showing me how. It would have been easy for this to have just become another cheap educational game, but Never Alone is so much more than that. It carries the sensibilities of its inspirations, and it feels and looks just as it should. Like the best folk tales, Never Alone is all about sharing the game with somebody else. Sometimes I'll find myself frustrated with the way history has played out. It's easy for me to harbor anger about the past and for me to seek some catharsis to ease that racial anger. Never Alone offers a different path. Recipes can be shared. Lessons can be taught. Words can be spoken. I just thought it was a really powerful um, piece. And uh, yeah, everyone should go play Never Alone. Um, And as an anthropologist, Charity, I'm wondering, you know, you've spoken to this a bit already, but do you think that games can be a viable medium for preserving and sharing history? Um, What makes Mm -hmm. games different from other methods of recording history? Mm -hmm. I definitely think it can be. um, The thing about a lot of just anthropology works, that one, that quote made me almost made me cry. I was like, damn, (laughs) just seeing the impact that it had um, on Mm -hmm. native people across the United States. Um, Um, One of the projects that I did recently last semester, um, I showed that films can be used as a medium um, to navigate identity and personhood, but can can also be used um, as anthropological work um, to kind of uh, record or put down as a record um, Mm. as what coming of age means in our communities, because there are amazing films and shows that navigate this, that don't just talk about a trauma, but talk about What's beyond that? What can you do? Who am I? Who am I? These are questions that run into just questions that I even ask myself to this day. Um, but with games, it goes beyond that because especially in Never Alone, like you're told these things that has like historical artifacts. It has um, the teachings elders tell you recorded um, in that in that game. But um, it's also a means to like saying, well, what like what's that journey you know what does this mean um you're never alone like you're you you have your community you have your elders um and even Mm. if some have passed on to the next life they're still with you their teachings are with you their memories are with you and Mm so um there are so many anthropological pieces um that only exist to educate uh you know white folks particularly about your culture but games specifically especially this game um is made by and for native youth and obviously this is open to everyone but the cook inlet tribal council their intent for this game was for native kids to um just learn because you know with the res- there w- there was an era in alaska where there were residential boarding schools we, f- we had elders you know my own grandmother um was sent to one and so um it's understanding that games like this can be used as a means to reconnect for so many folks back home but can also can be fun like it can be used as a means to like heal from that trauma um to break cycles of violence that were passed down because of colonialism and so um i don't know it does it, it, it's anti-anthropological inherently because it doesn't exist to educate um people about our existence but um, it's used as a means for us to navigate our own existence and our own placement in the world. Um, and I'm just, it's just beautiful. And I'm glad that Game Maker like, realized that because I feel like there are so many of us who, when we're doing this type of work, um, we do get hopeless at times because even here at Columbia, like there's this really famous anthropolo- anthropologist here, Franz Boas. I, when I see him in the afterlife, after life it's on site like i don't care <laughs> he's yeah. horrible but like when we learn i remember learning about how like um like in wit were literally displayed like little kids as they were alive like on pedestals here in new york city mm. and so um me as someone who's studying anthropology here having to deal with questions like that and navigating yeah. that and saying well is this okay for me um, to, what does it mean to like um 
retake that narrative? What does it mean to reclaim, to hold autonomy um, over my people um, instead of, you know, France, he's terrible. Also, there's mm-hmm. just a lot to unpack with him, but sure. really thinking about what it means to um, hold, what is it, reclaim our narratives again? And I feel like mm-hmm. that game particularly, and I definitely think that could even be heard in what that quote that he was saying, how he felt too, what it means um, to challenge the expectations that settlers hold for Native people, even through gaming um, and creating games for Native kids and how impactful that could be for them to like navigate personhood and identity, but also challenge the misconceptions that people hold for Native people, because that's what the game does. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's exciting. I wouldn't call myself an anthropologist yet. I still have to graduate. I have two more years. Yeah, yeah. But it's <laughs> emerging anthropologist. Emerging, yes, emerging <laughs> anthropologist. Um, I'm excited to see um, how scholars, but how kids even back home use gaming and film and shows and art specifically um, to understand why how first of all they're inherently anti-anthropological but how they can be Mm -hmm. used as a means to liberate entire communities um from the expectations from that settlers hold but also from our collective trauma you know you're someone who has whose work is known for you know, bringing attention to the impact of representation on real people. Um, I just, for folks who aren't familiar with Charity's work, um, you're known for, I keep saying your work, (laughs) but your work decolonizing (laughs) Western constructions of history and public education um, and addressing um, what you've named as the, uh, not just you, but what has been recorded as a dropout and graduation crisis of uh, with indigenous students um, because of curriculum, specifically history, um, that does not center or even honor or respect uh, the existence and enduring resilience of Native folks. Um, you actually created a Native-centric curriculum. Um, mm-hmm. Lessons and research that you've put together have since been adopted by your old high school in Anchorage, Alaska, um, with the hope of continuing to spread it through the school district. And I'm just, you know, You've spoken a bit to this, um, but what was the impact that you saw of your curriculum on Native youth? What yeah. what happened when they were able to finally um, see history that was truth and not translated or or diluted or erased uh, through the white lens? Right. Um, so I talked to two different populations my senior year. So this is research I did and um, wrote about. So I taught to a predominantly white classroom, and then I taught at the Alaska Native Heritage Center um, for a couple weeks um, during the program. And so they allowed me um, space to teach this curriculum to them. And um, we did a survey um, to just record the impact it had. And it was just phenomenal um, hearing the feedback that those the Native kids particularly, particularly had. Um, because when you're given autonomy back in the classroom, um, it's powerful. And um, particularly like education has been used as a tool to eradicate native people, especially back home in Alaska. Literally governmental policies were implemented, um, adoption policies, but the resident like physical policies, but also um, even in the mind. And that's when you know ongoing genocide is still happening. Ongoing cultural genocide is still happening where Um, people are learning that Native people only existed in the past, that we can't exist contemporarily. And so that's when people start building the the expectations that they hold for Native people starts in the classroom. And so um, I used my experiences um, when I was in elementary school because experiences me and my siblings faced growing up. Um, Because we faced a lot of just the casual racism. So I I was thinking about, okay, how do I combat the misconceptions that people hold for my people? and um, you know, my mother always emphasized education. And so that's why I'm, I'm in school right now, because we're like, I wouldn't be here without my mom. But um, my mom always emphasized education with me and my siblings. And so um, she helped me just think about um, ways we could help our community, even though we were, you know, hundreds of miles away from our, our village, from our mm. grandmother. Um, and so one of the things that I did my last year of high school, I was like, OK, let me do. I was like, because these were. Thoughts I've had 
starting high school, I was I knew this history because this is history that my mother told me. This is the history that my grandmother told me. And so mm. I compiled um, a history. I made slideshows. I created a curriculum. And honestly, this is work that like teachers do. Like I wasn't qualified, but I was like, you know what? Mm. I want people to understand this history because this is the first step in combating the misconceptions and the expectations that civil rules hold for our people. And um the intention this i was like this is for native kids like this is for native kids because i want them to feel seen i don't want them to experience what i had to to get where i am today um so seeing the effect that it had on those kids i was also friends with a lot of them too because this was like a program for high school native kids in the anchorage school district so these were kids yeah. from all the high schools in anchorage um but i was able to teach that to them and we held we held conversations um about what happened during World War II, about what happened when the Russians came to our land, about what happened when the Great Death, which is, you know, there was a pandemic that hit our communities and entire communities were lost. Entire generations were lost because of the sickness that we couldn't combat. And so we had a conversation about that and what it meant. Uh, you know, we had conversations about dysfunctional families. I feel like a lot of people can relate to that too, but how dysfunctionality stems from colonialism, stems from the act of not talking about it, the act of pretending as if it didn't happen. And so um, with the curriculum, I say we because I don't want to take credit for it because those kids had a really big impact. But we created space where we could talk about and have conversation um, about things we never were allowed to, you know, growing up. Because it's even with my grandmother, there are things that when we're back home in the village that, you know, we don't talk about. We my, my grandmother had many siblings, but, you know, a lot of them died because of the great death. So um, there were things that even in our own families, families back home where, you know, we couldn't really talk about these things. And so when the intention of that curriculum was for Native kids, but it also held space um, for healing. And then we also talked about, like, good things in our communities, things that are happening. Um, we talked about... Um, talked about the game i always talk about that game <laughs> i talk about ne like never alone yeah. in my curriculum but um i also didn't want to leave native kids feeling hopeless i mm -hmm. we provided resources for them like if you want to go to college this is what you can do these these are the programs that exist for you um so it didn't just focus like on our trauma but it also focused like how do we go about that how do we go about answering who am i um mm -hmm. so this was a curriculum for native kids and i don't know i just nationwide even in like this this is something that doesn't just in settler colonial states this is they use this tactic um a erasure of native people erasure of indigenous peoples in their curriculum um so that they don't take accountability for what they did to our people Mm -hmm. so what america did in the philippines is what america did in mm -hmm. samoa so what american america did in the Marshall Islands, this is what America does. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm I'm still angry about it. I'm still upset about it because I'm just one person. But um, I was able to do that. Like, I was 17 at that time. And, you know, to this day, like, I still work back home. I still do work back home. We still create anti-racist um, curriculum, especially after these past two years have been. Um, but making sure that people understand that um, no kid is too young to learn about this. Because these are mm -hmm. the lived experiences of our children back home. These are the lived experiences of us, like, here. So um, no one's ever too young to learn about this. And I always get, I always hear that from white parents. And I'm like, stop. Like, I don't want to hear you whine. Mm -hmm. um, like, why are you so scared? Um, why are yeah. you so uncomfortable? That's how it should be. Yeah. You need to feel uncomfortable with this history because... Um, it's it's happening still. It's happening. It's happening, and people need to understand how deep this is. So mm -hmm. we also don't focus on. But I just want to reiterate: we also focus on the joy of our community too, because absolutely, ooh, it's it's hard to talk about. But um, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank mm -hmm. you for for being willing to share what you have. So there's one more aspect of Never Alone that I want to touch on, um, just because you did mention that one of the areas that you are are interested in is the you know 
the state of the permafrost in, in your home of Alaska and just the environmental impacts of, of global warming uh, in mm-hmm. the future. Um, and there's also an environmentally conscious aspect of Never Alone. Um, in many of the interview clips, um, elders speak to the interconnectedness of all things, the uh, equality of man and animal, mm. um, as well as things like the rapid melting of icebergs that have been witnessed uh, in, in one lifetime. Um, and as Nuna, the main character, um, you have to work together with your companion, an Arctic fox, in a relationship um, that could feel symbolic of humanity's need to be cooperative with nature in order to survive. Um, we will not survive by trying to control or dominate nature. Um, we need the, a- the aid and the care of nature to grow and to thrive um, through the through this journey. Um, one where, uh, as the girl and the fox, you're traversing um, like broken flows of ice that are falling off from melting uh, icebergs and a blizzard that seems unending and stronger than any blizzard that's been seen before. Um, it feels as though the game also has a a message of, you know, trying to rebuild our connection to nature, um, to heal, to exist side by side with it. Mm-hmm. Um, just wondering if, if you know, that environmental messaging, does that resonate with you as someone who grew up in Alaska? Um, and what kind of relationship do you think is important for people to cultivate with nature? Yeah, I love this question. This is even something we're talking, I'm taking this class called Native America here with Professor Audra Simpson. I love mm-hmm. her, but she talks about this. And so particularly with the work that I do with climate change, when we view climate change, people have to understand that it's rooted in colonialism and capitalism, colonialism and capitalism together. And so um, what people don't understand is that when we approach climate change, we have to view the way we view the land needs to be different. Quantum mentally needs to be different because when you view the land as a commodity and something that is transactional, something that could be bought and sold that's where you you need to unpack that. And so, mm. especially, especially with this game, they navigate that. They understand, you know, Alaskan Native people, you pick an Inupiaq, back, especially understand um, the relation that we have with the land and with our animals is very, very beautiful. Like, mm. it's funny because, you know, our elders were already predicting, you know, 70 years before Western scientists even said what was happening. They said our our artists is rotting. We're not catching as much salmon. Um, when we go hunting for seal and whale, we're cognizant of um, even noise. We're like we don't mm. want to hurt the seals' um, ears. We don't want to um, disturb their 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 homes. We consider them as if they're our own because they feed us, they replenish us, they help us survive. Um, it's how we stay in good relation with one another. They're they're considered. They're a part of us. So, Mm -hmm. um, and it's weird when people, when people hear that, because particularly with Americans, I don't consider myself an American, but I did, (laughs) was born here, but particularly with, um, white Americans, um, they don't understand this relation that we have with our land that we have with our animals. I don't even say our with the land and the animals because they don't belong to us. Mm -hmm. Um, they help us survive and um i don't know i think it's a really beautiful relationship but even the way that they navigated that in the game i remember they were describing that even at the conference um was beautiful because this was at a time when climate change is still affecting our communities but even back then there were entire communities that were having to relocate because of um Mm. rising rising sea levels coastal erosion Mm-hmm. Um, and so when they were describing this, um, I think it reminded, reminded a lot of native kids that, um, the, our, our, the way, our, the way of being for our people, the spirituality beliefs that we have are beautiful. They still are. Um, and that when we approach climate change in the first place, um, we have to think about, we have to be reminded again of our relationship to land, um, be cognizant of others in our community, including the seals in our are in, our, in, in our in our community. Whales are in our community, and um, when you hunt a seal, yes, it's a coming of age thing. It's a way mm-hmm. to feed your community, but you also have to thank that seal for you know giving its meat so we could survive. And we use every part, every animal that we eat and subsist on. We use every part. We don't waste anything because that's disrespectful to that spirit, and so. 
I feel like with that game particularly, they did a really amazing job. And like her companion with um, that that fox. And it's funny because there's a lot of village dogs back home and like, really, <laughs> you know, good friends. We call them, they're called res dogs. Like, you know, mm. you know, like how in the lower fort eights, there's like reservations, res mm. dogs, back home village dogs. Um, and so um, it just reminded me um, about how beautiful our way of being is, but also how that way of being, how those spirituality beliefs can be used as a means to navigate issues we're seeing across the world, right? Yeah. Our people are smart, first of all, <laughs> because tell me how a 16-year-old native boy can hunt a whale by himself. That's yeah. that's phenomenal. Make it make sense. That is phenomenal. And people say, people have the audacity to tell us that we're not intelligent. You try surviving in those conditions mm-hmm. back home in Alaska. You try um going out to the sea and hunting a seal in the water like Mm -hmm. you know how phenomenal that is there are kids who could do that i don't know how to do that i'm still learning i know how to drive a boat now but (laughs) my little nephews my little cousins back home can hunt seal um can hunt birds um the way we go about hunting um it's not to take pictures it's not you know what those poachers do it's not to like brag about oh i caught this no it's about feeding our community it's about thanking that animal for giving us their meat um being cognizant of their spirit because it's still it lives on um reciprocity so um i think the game did an amazing job navigating that because again like it reminded me how beautiful it is i really i really like that question too but um i'm just excited to see how games can be used as a means of liberation. Because even from that game, it made me realize that um, the way of being, especially the Yupik way of being and spirituality, um, the way that we view land, um, not as a commodity, not as a commodity, not as something that can be transactional, but as something um, that gives and then we give back as something that is part of our being, that's part of our community, that's part of us. Um, it's really beautiful, but that's how we combat climate change. If people gave sovereignty back to us, if people th- thought like this, if organizations who emit CO2, who will, um, mm. cr- the fossil fuel industry, if they thought like that, would we be mm. in the conditions we are today? I don't think so. I know I'm only 20. I'm, I know I'm only, an, I'm only an undergraduate student, but I'm also indigenous. Our people are smart. I'm also Yupik and Samoan. Our people are smart. These are things they've always known. And you know, these are questions people really just are asking themselves when we navigate climate grief, you know, it's happening. Mm-hmm. Our generations, like especially us, we're having to deal with that burden that white colonial settlers put onto us mm-hmm. all in the pursuit of capitalism. It wasn't our fault, but we're having to face that burden. So people really need to think about, you know, what, what that means, but also how gaming this game can help um, us navigate that, you know? I feel like even Mm -hmm. this game can help us navigate um, that very question that we're all facing. Absolutely. Charity, it's been absolutely amazing having you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Where can folks follow you and keep up with your work? Yeah, you could just, I, my Instagram and my Twitter are the same, just Charity Roll Potty. So you just spell my first name and last name um, on both of those platforms, you'll find me. Also on Twitter, if you just look up Ice Age Baby, that there's a whole story behind that because people think I look like and I don't mind I think it's funny I love the Ice Age baby but just look up look that up on Twitter and then you'll find me but thank you awesome. again for your time you guys do such amazing work um, phenomenal very inspiring and thank you for still allowing me the space to talk about Charity thank you thank you for joining us on Pixel Therapy <laughs> is up for today's session of pixel therapy thank you for tuning in and we hope that listening to our thoughts and feelings gave you some thoughts and feelings of your own if you want more pixel therapy come check us out at patreon.com slash pixel therapy pod where you can snag that monthly bonus episode for just two dollars a month plus opportunities to get involved with the community and influence the show directly if you're not up for contributing monetarily but you enjoyed this episode you can show your support for free by rating and reviewing us on apple podcasts and following us on twitter and instagram at pixel therapy pod That kind of stuff is just as important, and we appreciate it just as much. Remember that Pixel Therapy is a happy member of the But Why Though Podcast Network, so you can support us by supporting them and heading over to butwhythoughpodcast.com. That's though with a T-H-O. Take a peek at the inclusive geek community they're building around pop culture news, reviews, and kick-ass podcasts like yours truly.
And you can keep up with all this stuff and more by visiting our website at pixeltherapypod.com. Finally, since we like to put our money and our energy where our mouth is, we end every episode with a recommended side quest. Thank you so much to Charity for letting us know about this week's organization. We are so excited to talk to you about the Center for Native American Youth at the Aspen Institute. It is a national education and advocacy organization that works alongside Native youth ages 24 and under on reservations in rural villages and urban spaces across the country to improve their health, safety, and overall well-being. All Native youth deserve to lead full and healthy lives, have equal access to opportunities, draw strength from Native culture, and inspire one another. At CNAY, this is achieved through empowerment and culturally competent methodologies that include leadership, youth-led policy agenda, and youth-led narrative. They're also hiring right now. So learn more about this awesome organization and donate at cnay.org. Thank you for that side quest, Spencer. That is our show for today. So go forth, run a story mission, level up some stats, and don't forget to hug an NPC every now and then. We'll be back soon with some more Pixel Pixel Therapy. therapy. Bye-bye. 